Guys, it is freezing here in North Carolina right now, and I'm a little new to this vlog stuff, so bear with me if I start shivering, but either way, I wanna introduce you guys to uh, this year's style of videos. You know, in the past, we've done a really well-produced Hooked on Wild Water show, and that was awesome, but this year it's gonna be completely different. As I'm dropping the show, I'm gonna be fishing the major pro circuit of kayak fishing events. So kayak bass fishing, uh, real trees, kayak bass fishing pro tour. Also gonna be fishing uh, a little bit of the hook bass master, you know, bass nation kayak series. And then of course gonna fish the Hobie Bass Open series. All of them have their pros. And uh, I'm gonna go experience a little bit of what each has to offer. So I'm just gonna pick and choose a little bit. There's about 27 total events to fish this year. So it's nuts, but I'm getting really excited about heading to Florida. And uh, that's what I'm doing here behind me. I'm kind of getting geared up for Florida for the 10 Invitational. Gonna try to go out there and win that and hopefully get into the 10. If, if that didn't work out, I might go up to Seminole and fish the Hobie Bass Open Series event there that weekend on the first and second, I believe. So come on, let me show you what's going on here. Everything's a mess, I haven't touched a thing. So. These kayaks have been on this trailer for a while. Killer Tennessee trailer, by the way. And uh, the RV is just kind of a mess inside there. I mean, look at all these kayaks just piled up. I got a lot of work to do. And uh, oh, a little bit frustrated I didn't get started earlier when it was warmer. We had some great warm weather. We're getting ready to move. So here, I got a little bit of an excuse. I'm trying to move houses, downsize a little bit. So hey, give me a break. I'm a little late in doing this. Some guys are already down there pre-fishing. I saw Jody Queen just caught a big one already. It's like, come on, man. I need a start. It's got a head start on us. But anyway, you can see the garage is a mess. Um, trying to move, so all my, my pegs for all my baits, they are gone. No longer here. But we'll get it figured out. I'm gonna get this figured out, guys. And I'm gonna get down there and catch a fish. I was down there in December, and that's kind of what this video is about. I was on the Kissimmee chain in December, and I got to spend a little time there and get a little bit of a lay of the land. And what I did is I found found some fish. That's the good news, I did find some fish. Hopefully they're still there. I feel like they're a very consistent uh, bite style of fish. I think they're going to be there still. So even though I'm gonna have two days of pre-fish, I feel confident I can get back on them. And the other thing I'm, I was able to do while I was down there is see a lot of the area thanks to uh, someone we just kind of stumbled you know, onto, ran into, and that was uh, Captain Wormy of Alligators Unlimited. Uh, airboat tours if you go down there definitely he's worth checking out I mean, those airboat tours I know they're loud they're annoying for us anglers but they are a ton of fun guys to go get on an airboat and just see everything out there it's actually really cool but uh, I learned a lot about the uh, the lay of the whole Kissimmee chain right you know he's right there uh, at the canal between uh, Hatchner Hall and Lake Kissimmee and he did an amazing job took, took me all around the area he can go we went north we went south we went everywhere and all kinds of crazy wild savannah type areas that are just airboat lanes really and that's one thing you know i want to talk about so again these videos here and especially this one this is a preview video for this event and if you're going to be fishing the the pro series uh for the kbf pro tour on the claremont channel lakes this also is important to you and it applies to to that event as well because there's going to be airboats there and it's a very similar you know water type but basically some of the best shallow water in these lakes is uh there's a, a channel in between the main lake and then there's a bunch of reeds and vegetation and then there's a channel right up against the bank you'll see it you look in satellite imagery you can see it what that channel is guys that is the airboat channels airboats are constantly running through there so i want to give you guys some tips especially since i was with captain wormy and learned a lot about airboats i want to give you guys some tips on how to make sure you're safe out there when you are going to be fishing super shallow and getting into those airboat channels that, that typically bass boats cannot get into that's the thing there's a lot of vegetation that separate them so a lot of bass boats can't get there and depending on water levels it's just hard for them uh, they draft a lot you know deeper than a kayak so we can get in there and get to some of those shallow fish but beware, okay, first of all, you're gonna hear airboats coming. You know you're gonna hear them, they're loud, they're coming your way. The thing you don't wanna do is tuck into the reeds. That's crazy. If you tuck into the reeds and try to hide, these airboats at any mo any point, can they just cut off and they go through the reeds. They go through, they can go on dry land basically. So you don't know when they're gonna do that. And if you hide in the reeds and all of a sudden an airboat comes and he decides he wants to go, you take a look at this gator over here or whatever they're checking out, these birds, they cut right through the middle of that vegetation, they could run you right over and they'll never see you. So what you actually wanna do is get out in the open where you can see the, the longest path where you can see this airboat you know, guide or, or, or driver and uh, just stick up your paddle and just kind of wave and let them know you're there. If you happen to be somewhere where there's hardwoods around close by, obviously if you tuck up under the hardwoods, then you know, you're gonna be safe there because they're not gonna go hit 
hardwood trees. So that's that's fine too. Have a flag on your kayak. Uh, make sure you're just super visible. You know, a yak attack visible is super important. Having something like that to be visible. And I think you'll be okay. So that's the tricks to kind of stay out of, you know, the airboat's ways because you just don't want to mess with them. And they're going to come, uh, you know, often on these tournaments, especially if any are held on the weekend. But basically one thing we got to look at is, um, you know, how to get out of the wind as a kayak angler. It's very hard. Uh, the Bassmaster Open down there in Kissimmee just recently, they had a very tough time when it was windy, even keeping bass boats on their spots, even with spot lock and things like that. So one thing we got to keep in mind is how are we going to get out of the wind? Because there's not a lot of, you know, you see all these beautiful trees here in the Carolinas. See that? Hardwoods, I can walk right up to them. If there's a lake in the Carolinas, you can get right up against the hardwoods. It's not like that down there. It's just open savanna land and wind comes whipping across there. This is Florida. This is a windy place to begin with. And now you have no chance to get up against hardwoods to block the wind. Your only hope in the main lake is reeds. Reeds is the only hope to stay out of the wind. Uh, obviously, if it gets really windy, what, we, what you can do, and I think what a lot of us are going to do, um, is probably get into the canals. A lot of these subdivisions are built through canals. There's a lot of, you know, wind breaks there. You can get next to hardwoods in the canals and uh, any of the, cr the creeks, uh, rivers that feed into these lakes. That's going to be important for us to uh, tap into. That. And this girl bit right in the mouth of this canal with this turbo crawls. Come here. Get her in. Yes. That's a solid fish right there. I got a turbo crawls and I rigged it a little bit differently. It's um, a little less than a half ounce but I actually wanted a little bit more weight and wanted it to fall in a different and glide in a different way. So I actually put a uh, weighted Mustad grip pin hook as well. So it's pretty uh, unique. It's been working so far. Hopefully we'll catch some more. Yeehaw. That's one thing I think, one strategy. Another thing you got to think about is you can tuck into areas, even on main lake, you can get into some cuts in some places that are just so thick with vegetation that the bass boats can't get through there, but then it opens up. And you can see this on satellite imagery. I don't need to point out where all these spots are. They're everywhere, all over the map. So all you gotta do is go check it out, um, look at the satellite images and see these areas that turn into little ponds and lakes back there. Some of those may be good, some may not. You just gotta go explore them. Um, and you, you certainly will see gators down there. They're typically not gonna bother you. They're gonna slither away and, and you're not gonna, obviously don't go close to any that are, that are sunning, but if you do, most likely they're gonna get away and, and slide away from you before um, you actually get real close to them anyway. But just obviously stay away. That's really hardly even need to say that. <laughs> Who's gonna go next to a gator, right? But the point is the wind is gonna be tough down there and it's gonna be a big factor in this tournament. Another thing you can do to sort of uh, avoid the wind. Obviously, if you do have a trolling motor that has spot lock, that'll help you stay on those offshore spots because let's face it, the bigger bodies of water, I mean, this isn't something groundbreaking here, but we all know the bigger the ocean, the bigger the fish. So, and typically that holds true, not always, but typically. So I think that, that the uh, bigger lakes, the bigger bodies of water, water may actually have, and there I am just kind of ugh, freezing here, I'm kind of stuttering, but you, you get what I'm saying, the bigger bodies of water will, in general, have the bigger population of bait and have the bigger fish. So that's why a lot of those big fish are caught on those main lakes. But either way, you can get out there and find some big ones offshore. And if you have spot lock or something like, like that, or a motor and you're good at holding yourself in place, you may have an advantage out there for sure. But then again, you know, the opposite can hold true because KBF is letting us fish a lot of these smaller lakes that the bass boat guys can't get into for these tournaments. Uh, they're, they're actually blocked by the locks there. So. They can't get into every lake. They can get into about maybe five of them. We're going to be able to fish, I believe, possibly about 10 of them. So a lot of water for us to kind of figure out and digest. And I don't blame a lot of the guys who are already down there trying to figure it out. I mean, I only got to see, you know, just a few of the lakes, but I can already tell, man, that the fishing is great down there. I caught fish. I found fish. I didn't catch the giants. Uh, I never found a really, really big fish, but I got, uh, I got on some numbers of fish. That was good. That was promising. There she is. Maybe the same fish, I'm not sure. Oh gosh, she came out of the water for that. Dang. Oh my goodness. There we go. Pretty good one. A four pounder. Ha <laughs> ha ha. Caught some decent fish for sure, but some of my best bites are actually the fish I lost. Ah, dang it. Oh, she came back for it. Shoot, what was that? Ah, dang it. Oh, she came back for it. Shoot, what was that? Bowfin or? Large man, that's a big fish. Whatever it was, it was big. 
big. It was real big. Here it is one more time in super slow motion. This was a big fish. You know, after watching this back, I, I can actually pretty much tell that was a bass. The way it just turned and thrashed on it, that's just not the same kind of strike as a bowfin. After, a, you know, a bowfin misses it, it just kind of, it just doesn't have that same sort of aggression, I guess, uh, the same way. They, they almost look like they're blind sometimes. And Eric Jackson actually caught one when I was down there with me. So you will catch bowfin down here in this chain. If you find bowfin, you may or may not be in a good area. Um, sometimes bowfin do hang out where bass are, but it could be a sign of low oxygen water because they can live in water that has lower oxygen that bass cannot. So if you're catching a lot of bowfin, you may want to move locations. You can see here, here's another big one that I, I missed. And big fish are here, and someone is probably going to hit the 100-inch mark one of these days, if not multiple days, and really crush this thing. That was a heartbreaker for sure, but at least we're around some big fish. And the biggest fish I actually saw caught, I was right next to Barry Wilson, oh, FLW to a pro, that week we were there kind of fishing. And you know he, he smoked this uh, six and a half pounder, so good fish are there. And I can't wait to get back to some of these spots and just check to see if I can find them, if they are still in those locations. That big old eyes. Yep. Heck yeah, look at that. So let's let's talk about you know one another key that I think is going to be a key at least to this tournament and you, you typically see it being key to almost every tournament but especially when you go down to Florida it's that early morning bite okay the low light bite that's critical for this tournament because and I saw this when I was down there I would catch fish right in the evening all of a sudden it gets kind of close to dark and the fish start schooling and start popping up same thing happened in the morning early morning you see them schooling busting you throw out there and they're there. All of a sudden, you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, somewhere in that range, you, it's like the fish didn't exist anymore. It was really hard. Um, and that's when you switch obviously to, you know, flipping, uh, you, you put away some of the other stuff you were throwing in the morning, be it top waters or whatever. And, and you could switch to flipping mats and, and other types of vegetation. Uh, you can get into those canals. You can get into uh, maybe some docks there in those little neighborhoods or whatever you want to try. But either way, you got to get, uh, you gotta get something in the morning or you're, you're done. If you don't get any fish in the morning, in that morning bite, cause obviously we don't have an, an evening bite, you know, we're done by, I don't know what it is, probably three o'clock. I, I gotta go back and read the rules, but you get the point. This is gonna be a very, very important part of this tournament. And I'm gonna kinda do a recap video of all my tournaments this year. And on the recap video, I'm gonna go over some of the points I'm bringing up now and just see how it affected the tournament. Just so I can see how well have I been predicting what is it's going to take to win these tournaments. How well have I been predicting the techniques or tactics or the big keys you know i should i should come up with some sort of name for these you know they, these are drew's whatever key something somebody out there think of something good drew's whatever key points or key tactics or whatever i'm dwelling on it way too long you guys can figure it out and help me help me with it but long story short we need to catch fish at that low light situation another key point one of drew's keys God, I just can't find what I want to use for that, but we'll get there. Give me, give me some time. I'm still new to this, guys. Uh, but one of Drew's keys for this tournament is going to be which type of vegetation are the fish relating to? You know, I mean, they're always going to key on one or the other, you know? And there's, I don't know how many. I don't even want to begin to guess how many different types of vegetation are down in Florida. But when I was there, I saw you know, pretty much everything there is known to man. It's there, you can find it. And if you learn about vegetation, uh, they, they grow on different kinds of bottoms sometimes, and that can give you clues to, uh, you know, if the bottom is hard there, soft, what have you. But um, that's gonna be a huge key to the event. Who can find the right kind of vegetation? Because when you get out there at these lakes, everything looks good, guys. Everything looks good, everything looks fishy. You know, and so it's not easy to pinpoint. You've got to find out the differences and that's going to be a struggle. I'm looking forward to it. And I think I've got a few keys, a few tips. Again, I'm not going to say them right now. This is coming out probably before the event. So I'm not going to quite divulge, but in my recap video, I can talk about what they were. So vegetation is key. And uh, another one of Drew's key points here for this event is going to be guys, 
the launches, okay, we don't have outboards. We, we have the, you know, a beautiful thing called the pickup truck, my Toyota Tacoma over here, uh, or my RV, if I've got my RV in the trailer, we can drive around wherever we need to drive to get to different launches, yes, but there's not many launches, okay? That's the problem, there's not many launches on this, you know, system of lakes. So if you launch somewhere, and you can pull up a, a measuring tool on Google Maps, and maybe you found some really cool looking spots, but they're like six, seven miles away from the nearest launch. How in the world are you gonna, you know, obviously with our troll motors, we can go a certain speed, you know, six miles an hour, maybe some, some of them six, seven miles an hour. But how in the world, uh, you know, are you going to find these places so far away and, and spend all that time going there, and then all of a sudden they're a waste of time and pre-fishing, you gotta go all the way back and go find some more. So the key is gonna be, can you get to some unpressured fish that are far away like that, given our limited number of launches? That's gonna be one of the keys. So, and you're gonna lose some fishing time if you do this. This is the, this is what, you know, obviously in any fishing tournament trail you're dealing with, you're faced with. You're always gonna lose fishing time if you make the long run. So, you know, that's something to, to watch and see who's fishing a lake that just gets a little less pressure from the boats, maybe. I mean, people can still launch in those other lakes that are allowed. They can launch boats there, but they are not accessible through the main, you know, Toho, Kissimmee, those main lakes. Um, so what's gonna win out? The smaller lakes like that, that maybe, maybe they don't get as much pressure, but maybe they actually do because people that aren't in the big, you know, bass boat tournament world decide to fish those instead. There's a lot more people still fishing, not in tournaments, that in tournaments, a lot of the locals. So maybe they're launching there and fishing those out. I don't know. Or maybe it's the opposite, the bigger ocean, just it's so big, nobody can cover it all, no one can figure it all out. Therefore, it still has the bigger, the bigger bait balls, the bigger uh, fish in it. I don't know, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. But that's gonna be a key for me is, is it worth the run going super far away? I'm really thankful I've got a motor guide over here and it'll, it'll push me, you know, six, seven miles an hour. So we'll see um, if that becomes a factor in this tournament. I think it could, I really think it could. If someone finds a honey hole somewhere with unpressured fish far away and are, and are willing to get to it and take the time to get to it, that could be a you know, very big, very, very big factor in who wins this Tim Invitational and the tent. Another big factor, Drew's factors, I don't know, we'll see. Another factor is going to be what stage of the spawn are these fish at? because at the Bassmaster Open, you saw weights of about 20 pounds, and, and I feel like that's around 92 to 97 inches, 20 pounds of, uh, on the bass boat side and weight. But, I mean, exactly what is going to happen with the spawn? Are they gonna move up? See, we got a big cold front that pushed through, a lot more cold air has come down to Florida since the Bassmaster Open. So a lot of people, typically in other parts of the country, if you have colder air come in, it's the, the fish come off the banks and they go back out deep and they, they delay their spawn. But it's been so warm in Florida. This is my theory, this is my take. I could be completely wrong. I haven't fished a ton of Florida guys, so I'm no, no expert on this, but this is just my theory. And when I was thinking about this and it's just sort of understanding how bass act, down in Florida, they need to be triggered with cold air, I would assume, to spawn. They need to get cold enough because there's a certain temperature too hot it, they just don't want to spawn it. So it just doesn't work correctly. So I think they might even be triggered more to go shallow, even though it's it's weird for us to think that this big cold fronts and cold air coming down there, lows in the thir upper thirties or whatever it's been, this may trigger the fish actually to move shallower, not pull out. This might trigger them to move shallower and start spawning. So I'm kind of excited about that. And maybe I'm just my eternal optimist self is just sort of hoping that that's what's gonna happen. Maybe, because I love to fish shallow. I love to fish power baits and moving baits. But, you know, we'll see how that sort of, you know, plays into things. Again, I'm not gonna give you guys, like, all the goods in these preview videos, because I'm still gonna be posting this before I fish the tournament. The next point I wanna talk about is, you know, what I'm looking to do. I'm definitely looking to catch some fish early, uh, use power baits. I wanna force fish and, and find fish, and then force them, but find fish that will eat the way I like to fish. I like to fish with, you know, chatter baits, buzz baits, spinner baits, really fast moving, power fishing techniques, covering a lot of water. I'm gonna go and find fish that will hopefully eat the way I want them to eat. And uh, I found them before, and hopefully I can find them again. And then it's just gonna determine, can I get a, a big bite? I really need a, a big, big bite. You know, five fish, five solid fish, two days in a row could do it. But somewhere you're gonna have to have a kicker, hopefully one a day, you know, at least two over the period of 
the tournament, then you're averaging hopefully 17 inches on everything else at least with a kicker, and, and you, I think you got a shot. So I'm going to predict something around uh, you know 193-ish inches, somewhere around there, 195 is going to win this thing. And I could be totally wrong, but that's that's the beauty of this. You know, it's just like the the fantasy kayak bass fishing thing that I started with uh, Ken Morris, um, who does the Hooked on Wild Waters podcast with me. You know, it's unpredictable. We're just prognosticating. We don't know what's going to happen. This, this year is going to be super exciting in the kayak fishing world because we're going to see what's going to happen. There's three major trails, and before there was there was uh, you know two ish last year. I mean, KBF had some sort of pro tour higher level events. And uh, they always have the national championship and the Hobie Bass Open Series began as well. So now it's just, it's really ramped up to another level. You know, with bass in the game, it's just changing everything because there's 27 total events. People cannot fish that many events. You can never do that. And, and we're not forced to be with one tour or the other, like the Bassmaster Elites or, or in the Bassmaster Elite Series. The Major League Fishing guys, they're in the MLF. FLW guys, they're over there. Now, of course, they can kind of fish opens in between, but in general, those, those leagues have what, eight? to you know 10 events so maybe if the guys are fishing a couple opens in between they're you know guys are fishing 15 events max but a lot of them just fish you know eight to ten uh, on their tour and that's that's about it so now we're looking at 27 total so what's going to happen you know which tour is really going to stand out as the one that people want to fish and uh you know which one's going to stand out as the one that that seems to be uh have all their ducks in a row and are running things you know properly uh, all the rules are vetted properly and uh, you know the payouts are there, you know timely manners, things like that. So I'm excited to see how this goes this year because the sky's the limit for this sport. The mainstream world doesn't know this yet. You guys watching this know this, but the mainstream fishing world still doesn't even understand where this can go and what this can do for this sport. I don't even probably understand, and I'm probably gonna be rolling over in my grave someday about how much money somebody's gonna be, you know, winning. When they win a kayak fishing tournament in 2000 and whatever 65 i mean it's gonna be crazy so guys it is freezing i've got to get inside and, and actually i got I need to get to work i got a lot of work to do it's thursday and uh, i leave on sunday and i've got tackle to organize i got kayaks to organize i got an rv to clean out it's a mess but uh trust me you, you don't want to see in that door my wife doesn't either she's disgusted and i got to get that cleaned up so let me get going, but I'll end on this. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow along with my adventures this year, all the ups and downs, the highs and the lows. I am swinging for the fences. I don't care if I end up in last place. I do not care. I've done enough in this industry, proven enough in this industry that doesn't bother me. And, it, and it, I think it frees me up to be able to swing for the fences. And hopefully in doing that, you, as you guys follow along, we're going to be able to learn you know, some things from it and get better. But hopefully in doing that, I'm more often than not going to end up at, you know in a good position hopefully some top top fives top tens hopefully even a win that's the idea obviously to win so i'm hoping that is what works out and that's what happens that's my game plan you're gonna see i don't utilize as many techniques as other people i keep it simple that's my plan i keep it simple i try to just i i there's certain techniques i like to use you're gonna find out in the recap video even more but there's certain styles and techniques some of you guys are laughing because you already know what they are obviously i have power fish chatter baits spinner baits buzz baits things like that but I try to just simply, my, my philosophy is to find fish that will eat the way I want them to eat. The way I want to fish, I'm going to find fish somewhere in that body of water. Somewhere I'm going to find them that will eat that way. And that's going to burn me, I'm sure, at some times. And getting into some, some tighter, smaller bodies of water or unexplored places, whatever, yeah, sometimes it's nice because, you know, the fish can certainly be a little unpressured and dumber, but it doesn't mean there's big ones there. It doesn't mean it's going to win a tournament. And it may not be worth that, especially when main lakes, you know, the bigger lakes, you know, like we said before, you know, the bigger the, the ocean, the bigger the fish and guys that can find them out there on main lake stuff and really get into them can just go and crush. And the last thing I want to say that's most important, and I hope you guys uh, have stuck around at this point, is I ran a river bass and tournament trail that I started, I think back in 2009. I ran that tournament trail for about 10 years and it's not easy. So I just want you guys to appreciate how much work and effort goes into these tournaments that, that uh, you know, Hobie, the guys at Hobie, the guys at Kike Bass Fishing, the guys at BASS, they are putting in a ton of work out there for us, and it's not easy. So 
let's thank them by following along with them on social media. Let's thank all their sponsors by supporting their sponsors. Those are the folks who are supporting us, the kayak fishing community. They're supporting us. So why would we not support them with our dollars? With Go up to them after a tournament and say, hey, I understand how hard this is. And I appreciate you doing that because they're putting a lot of smiles on people's faces, creating a lot of joy in people's lives and giving them you know, a reason to get excited and follow along. And speaking of follow along, the last thing I wanna say is, I know I've probably said last thing multiple times here, but last thing is go in, uh, to hookedonwildwaters.com and there's a tab up top that says fantasy. That's how you get into the fantasy kayak bass fishing game. And why that's important is this gonna obviously allow us to follow along with these tournament trails a lot closer, but even more so the anglers, the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, any major sport, golf, they are very good at promoting their stars. And we've got some really cool characters and some really cool stars to be in stars already in this sport but a lot of people still don't really know they aren't aware but if you play the fantasy game it's really cool you simply pick six players and the money they earn the checks they cash this year on the three major tournament trails equal fantasy points for your team so it's pretty easy and it gives you a reason to follow along with the tournament trails and these anglers follow them on social media you're going to learn a lot from them and it just sort of helps promote the entire sport because you know again i'm fortunate to be I've been doing this for a long time. Started back in uh, 2003, 2004, and then 2009, I worked with Jackson Kayak. Started with them to develop my signature series kayak, the Kusa. And we've come a long way, guys. We've come a long way. And the, what I'm getting to here is the fact that those of us who kind of helped found this, who started a lot of this, Chad Hoover, obviously, big name, started a lot of this stuff. We're still in this, and we're still trying to get it to grow in a bigger way but grow the right way. That's most importantly, to grow the right way. Because kayak fishing saves lives. It saves a lot of people's lives. It gives them hope. It gives them a reason to get out there and enjoy God's creation. And that's what drew me to it. You know, it got me to wild places. It was a, the best tool to get me to these wild places where I could, I, I could catch unpressured fish. And it just felt right. Something about it just felt right. And it probably kept me out of a lot of trouble. If I didn't have something in my life that I was addicted to like I am kayak fishing, and there are, so, you know, certainly probably bad to be addicted to anything, but if there's anything good to be addicted to i guess kayak fishing would be one of them and it's going to keep folks out of a lot of trouble so continue to spread the love of the sport we can grow it grow it the right way that doesn't sort of turn this into something that that we don't ever want to see happen we can still keep this a tight-knit community family community keep growing it the right way and sort of control its growth because the guys who started this thing from the very beginning are still here this is still a very young sport but the beauty of today's social media age is we can grow get the word out something super fast but for now, while we're still here, we can control it. We can keep this in our hands a little bit and do it the right way. So I'm excited to get down to Florida. If you've hung in this long, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you down in Florida. Wish me luck. If you're doing fantasy, you better pick me. You better pick me. I'm telling you, I'm swinging for the fences. We'll see you. Later.